The human being is a, a special kind of creature because, for many reasons, uh, on a practical level, I think in a way that most people would agree, and we can see from just about every angle, and it's regardless of religion or uh, any kind of persuasion, is that the human being is that kind of creature that has a tendency to be preoccupied with its own existence. So we tend to think about things, um, well, we care about our existence, and we care about the fact that we are engaged in the world. That caring that we have is a very subtle kind of care. It's not something that we are you know, continually focused on this object or that object per se, or that we have one concern or two concerns per se, but rather it's that we are, you know, things m matter to us in such a way um, that they come in and out of the surroundings that are around us by virtue of that attention that we give to these kinds of things. And that kind of, uh, that, that attention uh, in Arabic is called himma, himma, uh, which can be translated as um, ambition or zeal or aspiration. And that himma, that, that the, the kind of focus, the, it's not even so much a focus as it is an ambition. So the general push that we have that propels us, that push, puts us forward, is really just the fact that we exist and we, and we recognize and we care about our existence that pushes us forward. Um, and it's, it's different than other creatures in the sense that um, our propelling forward has a kind of distance, um, has a kind of scope that um, we don't we wouldn't be able to vouch for when it comes in to other creatures. But at the same time, that, that himma, that ambition, himma also, uh, if you look in some of the Arabic dictionaries like Lisan al-Arab and other books, you'll find that himma is also understood as al huzan which is this kind of, uh, it's grief, what others might call anxiety. So we have this kind of grief, um, and what grieves us um, internally is that is that which is left undone. What grieves us internally is that which is left undone. Those things that we that we can't seem to uh, we can't seem to to do uh, to take care of. So, in other words, we're constantly engaged in actions. We're constantly engaged in the world. The engagement is such an intense kind of engagement that we don't even realize that we're engaged in the world, and uh, as a re and the reason why we're engaged like that is because we're preoccupied with our very existence. We don't really think about all of that, uh, and we tend to only think about our being in the world when something goes wrong. Because what happens is that our ambition, our himma, is focused on a very specific uh, entity. So, for example, if the mouse on my computer suddenly isn't working. I mean, it's been there the whole time, but I wasn't preoccupied with that ex extent um, object. It's there; it's in my peripheral vision, but I'm not, uh, I'm not engaged in it like that. My himma, my aspiration, my anxiety, right, is not focused on this thing. So, uh, so I don't notice it. So I just go along, clicking, 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 until until the battery runs out or something goes wrong, um, then now I'm stuck trying to figure it out. My ambition is my, 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 uh, my zeal, my aspiration is make sure this thing works right again. So in this, sorry, I have a, a bit of a cold. So in this uh, intimate conversation that Ibn Atayla is giving us, he, he expresses what it is that his heart said to him. And it's understood to be an inspiration that comes from upon high. Uh, wherein the master says, O slave, make your, your himma, 
your ambition, your, your zeal, your, your aspiration, again, even your grief, your worries, your concern for me to be in place of your uh, himma for daily provision. Right? So we put our ambitions and our scope and our energies and we try to take away the grief that we feel related to prolonging our lives, prolonging our existence by aiming that energy specifically in the acquisition of provision. And, th and that's the truth. We spend most of our day, even though we don't think about it, we're spending most of our day trying to make sure that this little space here, which is not even, you know, well, hopefully it's not larger than, you know, two, two fists together, perhaps. You know, for some people it is quite larger than that, but that's another, that's another discussion. We spend all this time trying to make sure that that space is, is, uh, is full. When, the, when in reality the himma that God gave us, the aspiration that God has given us, is not for this little space, you know, this little you know, two-fist space. It's, 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 he gave it to us for something much higher than that. So he says, make your himma for me to be in place of your himma for daily provision because it's a serious aspiration that we have. It's a serious concern that we have. We're grieved over that. He said, why? Why, why, should, you do, why should you do that? He's saying, for do not tire yourself with what I have already taken the burden of for you, or off for you. And that burden which you, you have taken upon yourself, then carry it. Right? So we just, that's not our responsibility in the sense that we're not going to be able to create uh, sustenance from nowhere. It's not, we, don't, we can't do that, even though we'd like to be able to do that. It, it, it's only going to come from some way that's been provided from God, from some other direction. We do not cause... Uh, sustenance to out of thin air. Here we are, like a ma'ida from the sana, you know, like a, you know, a table spread that's going to appear from the heavens. That's not what we do, right? Generally, that's not what we do. The fact that Sayyidina Isa al Sallam made du'a and this was what happened is to show you that it's not not a norm. But we act as if my efforts and what it is that I do and how I prepare for things is going to make the food drop from the heavens. So we so we aspire that way in this mission impossible. So he's saying that. Uh, for, for, you know, I, I have already taken the burden off for you, and that burden which you have taken on upon yourself, and then carry it. You know, you just run off with it. Would we cause you the question? Now, now he's asking, now it's like, this is the, the reasoning. It's an argument. It's a question. Would we cause you to enter into my abode? In other words, this, this earth belongs to God. Would we cause you to enter into my abode, but keep you from my goodness? Is that what you know about God? Has God always shown you the good? Maybe you don't see it every moment because of the fact that you and I are blind from what's good and bad. We don't know. Because good is ultimately what is beneficial, and we don't know what's beneficial in the end. And it certainly doesn't look like things are going to be beneficial for us. For the, for the duration of... Uh, of the test that we're going through. Would we cause you to enter into my abode, this earth, but keep you from my goodness? Is that what you know about me? If you look inside your heart, is that what you find to be the case? Or is that what you find to be the case about people? Usually when we have a bad opinion about God, it's because we're making him like a person. And that's not, that's not right. Question. Would we bring you forth to my creation, but keep you from the existence of my aid? In other words, am I going to bring you out from nothing, just like you expect that food to come to you from nothing, from your own efforts? I cause you to become manifest in this universe, in this earth, through my own efforts, without recourse to anything else. Knowing that to be the case about me, would I then would I do this? but then keep you from the existence of my aid. I've given you your existence, yourself. Do you think that I'm going to keep the existence of my aid from you now? Does that make sense? Is that the pattern that you've seen? Would we take you out of our existence, but keep you from my generous giving? In other words, would we take you out from paradise? Would, you, would we take you out from the presence that you knew before you came into this world? which is nothing but generosity. 
and then keep you from my from my generous keep you from that de- generous giving inside of the world. In other words, in other words, does the world make God stop being unkidding? Is that what is that what the world does? Does the world have that power? Does the world have that capacity? The world has no power. The world has no capacity. What I demand from you, my right, which is to worship me, but keep you from the existence of my provision for you. In other words, does it make sense that I would create you to worship me because it's my right, but then not give you the sustenance to be able to do so because in the end of the day it means that my right's not being met? Would I require from you my service but not require from uh, from me my allotted portion I destined for you? Would I require, in other words, I have obliged you to serve me. But you're not going to be able to do that unless it is that I have given you the portion that you need to be able to do so. It's just reiterating the first point. It doesn't make any sense. The, the, the nafs, the ego, it doesn't make any sense talking that way to you. Be warned. I have with me for you various gifts, and in you I have manifested my universal mercy. <laughs> I mean, this is mind-boggling. Be warned. I have with me, for you, various gifts, many, many gifts, limitless gifts. And in you, I have manifested my universal mercy. The question that has to come to the mind is, why didn't God manifest his universal mercy in the universe outside? That's, and that's, the, that's the, the delicate point that's inside this, this, this intimate conversation. It's because this is the small universe this is the compact, everything is inside here. Everything is here. And so, and so God causes everything to manifest here. We are the ones who recognize existence. We are the ones who recognize being. We are the ones who are engaged and who are able to, to, to say God's name. Not even a star in the, a star in the cosmos can't, doesn't have that capacity. Unless Allah gives it to, to it. I was not satisfied with the world for you. In other words, I didn't, you are more valuable to me than the world. So therefore, the world, as it's not valuable to me, other than Allah, that, that my name should be mentioned inside of the world, and you're the one who's going to do that. I was not satisfied with the world for you itself. Mm-mm. And with all I sorted up for you in my garden. In other words, we were taken out of paradise because God was not satisfied with that for us. And I was not pleased with all of that for you until I granted you the vision of me. In other words, if we had these things, if we had the world, and if we had the garden, and we had all the beautiful things that are inside of it, but we didn't have God's vision, what would we have? We have nothing, just a bunch of creation again and again, forever and ever. At the end of the day, isn't it true that paradise is nothing but a, a, a superior creation? I mean, that's an oxymoron. There's nothing superior about creation. But to be able to have the vision of God, to be able to have the vision of perfection itself, God wasn't satisfied for anything at all with us except for that. Meaning that when we see and when we have scarce, when we are concerned and we're scared about our provisions, He has already provided, provided us with the greatest of provisions, and that is the vision of Himself. So how can we be concerned about these lower provisions? So if such are my actions, in other words, if this is what I do, then how can you ever be in doubt of my bounty? What has caused us to be disillusioned about our Lord? May Allah give us Allah. Jazakallah khair. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 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 Wa sallam.